Today I'm going to take up the next section of the Red Book by C.G. Jung. It's entitled Murder of the Hero. This is not Today such I'm an easy section of the book to understand, keeping in mind that the Red Book it's is about visions and active imagination. I'm going to be reading from uh, Dr. Edward Edinger's book, Transformation of the Libido, which relates to Dr. Edinger's lectures on Symbols of Transformation, Volume 5 of Dr. Jung's Collected Works. And I'm also going to be referring to Memory Streams Reflections, which is Dr. Jung's memoirs of his psychic changes over his lifetime. So the Red Book and Memory Streams Reflections are like bookends into Dr. Jung's prodigious scholarship, reflection, and writing on the nature of the psyche. We have to remember that at the time of the Red Book, Dr. Jung was uh, emotionally very upset by a variety of things that were happening in his life. And what he didn't understand in the fall of 1913 was he was also very attuned to the collective unconscious of Europe at that time. And he was having very bloody visions and those visions were frightening to him because he had had a lot of experience with psychotics and schizophrenics in the Bergotsli Mental Hospital in Zurich and he thought he might be having a psychotic breakdown. And these visions were very bloody indeed. I've talked about them a little before, so I'll leave that discussion uh, for those videos. But it turns out that this segment of the Red Book really is the beginning of Dr. Jung's ideas about changes in attitude and what it takes to change the attitude of the public mind. In 2014, I wrote a book called Political Psychology, New Ideas for Activists. And in that book, I wrote an essay called There Will Be Blood. I'll put a link to that essay with the commentary of this essay so that you can find it. This is on a new channel that I'm creating based on my book, which is called Political Psychology. I urge you to take a look at that YouTube channel. It is just beginning, and I would very much appreciate it if you would subscribe and click on the little bell next to the subscription on the Political Psychology channel. That will indicate to me that you're interested in hearing more about what I think about political psychology. Now, this segment of the Red Book is about changes in attitude, and what Dr. Jung is talking about is not only a change of his own attitude, but the existence of an attitude in the collective unconscious of the German people. And the sad thing is that he recognized what was happening, but no one else paid much attention to him and his understandings about the depth psychology of societies. And so he was going through the Red Book period during World War I. He recognized the collective unconscious, and by 1919, he already was able to predict that World War II would come, even before the rise of Adolf Hitler. So this change of attitude segment of the Red Book is extraordinarily important, and it's important to us today because what it says to us is that some of us who are intuitive enough can already predict how certain political decisions are going to ultimately come down and what it will take to change things. I'm thinking particularly about the gun debate, about abortion debate, about many other decisions in American political life that contain attitude. And, and attitude doesn't change easily. So by the end of this video, you're going to understand what it has taken to change human attitudes over the centuries 
and why all the incessant harangues that we get on our cable networks, regardless of what our political position is, um, have very little effect on our attitudes. Those of us who are intuitive, if we sit quietly by ourselves, can know what the ultimate result will be and what it will take to make the changes we hope for. So keeping in mind now, this segment is called Murder of the Hero. And in this case, the footnote tells us that this refers to the mourning for the death of the hero. I'm going to read the passage directly through and then read some of the footnotes that Sono Shamdasani put in the reader's edition of the Red Book. Then I'll read what Dr. Edinger has to say about it. And finally, I'll read what Dr. Jung said at the end of his life in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Dr. Jung was having this vision on December 18th, 1913, so approximately eight months before the outbreak of World War I. Murder of the Hero. On the following night, however, I had a vision. I was with a youth in high mountains. It was before daybreak. The eastern sky was already light. Then Siegfried's horn resounded over the mountains with a jubilant sound. We knew that our mortal enemy was coming. We were armed and lurked beside a narrow rocky path to murder him. Then we saw him coming across the mountains on a chariot made of the bones of the dead. He drove boldly and magnificently over the steep rocks and arrived at the narrow path where we waited in hiding. As he came around a turn ahead of us, we fired at the same time, and he fell slain. Thereupon I turned to flee, and a terrible rain swept down. But after this, I went through a torment unto death, and I felt certain that I must kill myself if I could not solve the riddle of the murder of the hero. Then the spirit of the depths came to me and spoke these words. The highest truth is one and the same with the absurd. This statement saved me, and like rain after a long hot spell, it swept away everything in me that was too highly tensed. Then I had a second vision. I saw a merry garden in which forms walked clad in white silk, all covered in colored light, some reddish, the other bluish and greenish. I know I have stridden across the depths. Through guilt, I have become a newborn. We also live in our dreams. We do not live only by day. Sometimes we accomplish our greatest deeds in dreams. In that night, my life was threatened since I had to kill my Lord and God not in single combat, since who among mortals could kill a god in a duel? You can reach your god only as an assassin, if you want to overcome him. But this is the bitterest for mortal men. Our gods want to be overcome, since they require renewal. If men kill their princes, they do so because they cannot kill their gods, and because they do not know that they should kill their gods in themselves. If the god grows old, he becomes shadow, nonsense, and he goes down. The greatest truth becomes the greatest lie. The brightest day becomes darkest night. As day requires night and night requires day, so meaning requires absurdity and absurdity requires meaning. Day does not exist through itself. Night does not exist through itself. The reality that exists through itself is day and night. So the reality is meaning and absurdity. Noon is a moment. Midnight is a moment. Morning comes from night. Evening turns into night. But evening comes from the day and morning turns into day. So meaning is a moment and a transition from absurdity to absurdity and absurdity only a moment and a transition from meaning to meaning. 
Oh, that Siegfried, blonde and blue-eyed, the German hero, had to fall by my hand, the most loyal and courageous. He had everything in himself that I treasured as the greater and more beautiful. He was my power, my boldness, my pride. I would have gone under in the same battle, and so only assassination was left to me. If I wanted to go on living, it could only be through trickery and cunning. Judge not. Think of the blonde savage of the German forests, who had to betray the hammer-brandishing thunder to the pale Near Eastern god who was nailed to the wood like a chicken marten. The courageous were overcome by a certain contempt for themselves, but their life force bade them to go on living, and they betrayed their beautiful wild gods, their holy trees, and their awe of the German forests. What does Siegfried mean for the Germans? What does it tell us that the Germans suffer Siegfried's death? That is why I almost preferred to kill myself in order to spare him. But I wanted to go on living with the new God. After death on the cross, Christ went into the underworld and became hell. So he took on the form of the Antichrist, the dragon, the image of the Antichrist, which has come down to us from the ancients, announces the new God, whose coming the ancients had foreseen. Gods are unavoidable. The more you flee from the God, the more surely you fall into his hand. The rain is the great stream of tears that will come over the peoples, the tearful flood of released tension. After the constriction of death had encumbered the peoples with horrific force, it is the mourning of the dead in me which precedes burial and rebirth. The rain is the fructifying of the earth. It begets the new wheat, the young, germinating God. Footnotes. Going back to the beginning. Right at the beginning, Dr. Jung says, On the following night, however, I had a vision. This footnote. December 18th. 1913. Black Book 2 has, quote, The following night was terrible. I soon awoke from a frightful dream. The draft has, quote, A mighty dream vision rose from the depths, unquote. The Red Book says, Then Siegfried's horn resounded over the mountains with a jubilant sound. Footnote, Siegfried was a heroic prince who appears in Old German and Norse epics. In the 12th century, he is described as follows, quote, And in what magnificent style Siegfried rode! He bore a great spear, stout of shaft and broad of head. His handsome sword reached down to his spur, and the fine horn which this lord carried was of reddest gold. His wife, Brunhild, is tricked into revealing the only place where he could be wounded and killed. Wagner reworked this epic in The Ring of the Nibelung. In 1912, in Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, Jung presented a psychological interpretation of Siegfried as a symbol of the libido, principally citing Wagner's libretto in Siegfried. The text says... But after this, I went through a torment unto death. The footnote says, the draft continues after this dream vision. And I felt certain that I must kill myself if I could not solve the riddle of the murder of the hero. Footnote, in Black Book 2, Jung noted, I strode light-footedly up an incredible steep path and later helped my wife who followed me at a slower pace to ascend. Some people mocked us, but I didn't mind, since this showed that they didn't know that I had murdered the hero. Jung recounted this dream in the 1925 seminar, stressing different details. He preceded it with the following remarks, quote, Siegfried was not an especially sympathetic figure to me, and I don't know why my unconscious got engrossed in him. Wagner's Siegfried, especially, is exaggeratedly extroverted and at times actually ridiculous. I never liked him. 
Nevertheless, the dream showed him to be my hero. I could not understand the strong emotion I had with the dream. After narrating the dream, Jung concluded, quote, I felt an enormous pity for him, Siegfried, as though I myself had been shot. I must then have had a hero I did not appreciate, and it was my ideal of force and efficiency I had killed. I had killed my intellect, helped on to the deed by a personification of the collective unconscious, the little brown man with me. In other words, I deposed my superior function. The rain that fell is a symbol of the release of tension. That is, the forces of the unconscious are loosed. When this happens, the feeling of relief is engendered. The crime is expiated because as soon as the main function is deposed, there is a chance for other sides of the personality to be born into life. That quote is from Introduction to Jungian Psychology, pages 61 and 62. In Black Book 2, and in his later remarks about the dream and memories, page 204, Jung said that he felt that he would have to kill himself if he could not solve this riddle. Now what Dr. Jung is talking about is his superior function, which was his thinking function. But his thinking function was controlling him, as Logos frequently controls our politics today. But in order to have wholeness, we need to include both logos and eros, both logic, rationality, and life. And what Dr. Jung was experiencing was that his logos side was overwhelming him. Siegfried in this dream was a personification of his logos. And his point was that in order to open himself up to life, to eros, he had to kill the logos. This allowed wholeness to enter into his being. This is a fundamental idea in Dr. Jung's oeuvre that isn't well understood. The text continued, Then I had a second vision. Footnote, quote, I fell asleep again, and a second dream vision rose in me. Unquote. I saw a merry garden in which forms walked clad in white silk, all covered in colored light, some reddish, the others bluish and greenish. Footnote. The draft continues. These lights pervaded my mind and senses, and once again I fell asleep like a convalescent. Jung recounted this dream to Agnella Jaffe and commented that after he had been confronted with the shadow, as in the Siegfried dream, this dream expressed the idea that he was one thing and something else at the same time. The unconscious reached beyond one, like a saint's halo. The shadow was like the light-colored sphere that surrounded the people. He thought this was a vision of the beyond, where people are complete. In the text, I know I have stridden across the depths. Through guilt, I have become a newborn. Footnote. The draft continues. The world in between is a world of the simplest things. It is not a world of intention and imperatives, but a perchance world with indefinite possibilities. Here the next ways are all small. No broad, straight high roads, no heaven above them, no hell beneath. In October 1916, Jung gave some talks to the Psychological Club of Zurich called Adaptation, Individuation, and Collectivity, in which he commented on the importance of guilt. The first step in individuation is tragic guilt. The accumulation of guilt demands expiation. The text continues, We also live in our dreams. We do not live only by day. Sometimes we accomplish our greatest deeds in dreams. Footnote. The draft has here an addition, quote, Are you smiling? The spirit of this time would want to make you believe that the depths are no world and no reality. We have certainly seen this quite clearly in the way the spirit of this time, 
100 years ago, but also through the following century, has suppressed Dr. Jung's work. The spirit of this time would want to make you believe that the depths are no world and no reality. The text says, you can reach your God only as an assassin. Footnote, the draft continues, quote, a Judas, unquote. The text says, so meaning is a moment and a transition from absurdity to absurdity and absurdity only a moment and a transition from meaning to meaning. We all might want to remember that in the politics of the United States just now. Footnote, the draft continues. My dream vision showed me that I was not alone when I committed the deed. I was helped by a youth, that is, one who was younger than me, a rejuvenated version of myself where the text says, but their life force bade them go on living and they betrayed their beautiful wild gods, their holy trees, and their awe of the German forests. Footnote, the draft continues, quote, Siegfried had to die just like Wotan. In 1918, Jung wrote of the effects of the introduction of Christianity into Germany. Christianity split the German barbarian into his upper and lower halves and enabled him by repressing the dark side to domesticate the brighter half and fit it for culture. But the lower, darker half still awaits redemption and a second domestication. Until then, it will remain associated with vestiges of prehistory, with the collective unconscious which must indicate a peculiar and increasing activation of the collective unconscious. He expanded on this situation in his essay, Wotan, in 1936. Now, all this relates to one of Dr. Jung's most famous quotes, which is, too much of the animal distorts civilized man. Too much civilization makes sick animals. The text goes on, but I wanted to go on living with a new god. Footnote. In the draft, this sentence reads, we want to continue living with a new God, a hero beyond Christ, to Aniela Yaffe. He recounted that he had thought of himself as an overcoming hero, but the dream indicated that the hero had to be killed. This exaggeration of the will was represented by the Germans at that time, such as by the Siegfried line. A voice within him said, if you do not understand the dream, you must shoot yourself. The original Siegfried line was a defensive line established by the Germans in northern France in 1917. This was actually a subsection of the Hindenburg line. The text concludes, The rain is the fructifying of the earth. It begets the new wheat, the young germinating god. Footnote. The theme of the dying and the resurrecting God features prominently in James Fraser's The Golden Bough, a study in magic and religion, which Jung drew upon in Transformations and Symbols of the Libido. Now I'm going to go to Dr. Edward Edinger's discussion of it in Transformations of the Libido. On page 65, Dr. Edinger says, what is needed, rather than a heroic ego, is a Jungian ego. I'll tell you why I use that term. This myth, and that is the reason I went into it so specifically, belongs very explicitly to Jung. The reason we know that is from memories, dreams, reflections, and the dream that he reports there on page 180. He had this dream in 1913, just as he was having his full encounter with the unconscious. Jung was extremely bothered by this dream. Finally, its meaning came to him, quote, Why, that is the problem that is being played out in the world. Siegfried, I thought, represents what the Germans want to achieve, heroically to impose their will, have their own way. Where there is a will, there is a way. I had wanted to do the same, but now that was no longer possible. The dream showed that the attitude, 
embodied by Siegfried, the hero, no longer suited me. Therefore, it had to be killed. Unquote. The attitude of the heroic ego is only relevant for the first half of life. When one comes to the second half of life, where conscious individuation is required, then the heroic attitude has to die, as the myth makes clear. The ego, in its heroic way, can grab what it wants, but it does not know what to do with it. It becomes possessed by it. So in our materialistic world, for example, the ego could say, well, I want to have a Mercedes in my driveway. But the ego doesn't know what to do with it, because once it has it, then you have to realize that it is just a vehicle with four wheels and it needs oil changes, just like any other car. Edinger goes on, there are different ways of dealing with the unconscious as monster. Jung describes these ways and says in paragraph 571 of Symbols of Transformation of the Libido, In Rome, money offerings were thrown every year into the Lacus Curtius, formerly a chasm that had been closed through the sacrificial death of Curtius. He was the hero who went down to the underworld in order to conquer the danger that threatened the Roman state after the opening of the chasm. This is not one of our better known myths, so I thought I would say a word about it. The mythical story is that some great earthquake or violent event caused a great opening in the middle of the Roman Forum. It went so deep that nothing would fill it up, and the soothsayers declared that if the Romans wished the commonwealth to be everlasting, they must devote to this chasm the principal strength of the Roman people. Curtius, on hearing this answer, said the most valuable thing belonging to the Roman people is their arms and their courage. They agreed with him, so he arrayed himself in full armor, mounted his horse, and plunged into the chasm. At that point, the earth immediately closed over him. What is being said here? The soothsayers told the Roman people to devote to this chasm what constituted their principal strength, their arms and their courage, in other words, their heroic Roman attitude. That is the essential nature of Rome at its peak. It is the attitude of the triumphant ego, ego power. The myth is true, but Rome did not follow it consciously, and so it had to go down to destruction. The heroic ego representing the arms and courage and power of Rome, personified by the hero Curtius, offered itself as a sacrifice, and that closed the chasm. The psychological reference is that when the chasm of the unconscious opens up to the ego and threatens to swallow it, the way the ego succeeds in closing it and coming to terms with it is by sacrificing the heroic ego attitude. That is the way it is done, and that is the way Jung did it. As the unconscious opened up in a threatening way, he had this dream of killing Siegfried that saved him. It is an exact replica of the myth of Curtius. It is a very fundamental image, and there may come a time when you need to remember it. So finally, I want to read what Jung said at the end of his life in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page 180. Filled with disgust and remorse for having destroyed something so great and beautiful, I turned to flee, impelled by the fear that the murder might be discovered. But the tremendous downfall of rain began, and I knew that it would wipe out all traces of the dead. I had escaped the danger of discovery. Life could go on, but an unbearable feeling of guilt remained. When I awoke from the dream, I turned it over in my mind, but was unable to understand it. I tried, therefore, to fall asleep again, but a voice within me said, You must understand the dream, and you must do so at once. The inner urgency mounted until the terrible moment came when the voice said, If you do not understand the dream, you must shoot yourself. In the drawer of my night table lay a loaded revolver, and I became frightened. Then I began pondering once again, and suddenly the meaning of the dream dawned on me. 
why that is the problem that is being played out in the world. Siegfried, I thought, represents what the Germans want to achieve, heroically to impose their will, have their own way. Where there is a will, there is a way. I had wanted to do the same, but now that was no longer possible. The dream showed that the attitude embodied by Siegfried, the hero, no longer suited me. Therefore, it had to be killed. What we're talking about here is a time of midlife crisis for Dr. Jung. After the deed, I felt an overpowering compassion, as though I myself had been shot, a sign of my secret identity with Siegfried, as well as the grief a man feels when he is forced to sacrifice his ideal and his conscious attitudes. This identity, my heroic idealism, had to be abandoned, for there are higher things than the ego's will, and to these one must bow. These thoughts sufficed for the present, and I fell asleep again. The small brown-skinned savage who accompanied me and had actually taken the initiative in the killing was an embodiment of the primitive shadow. The rain showed that the tension between consciousness and the unconscious was being resolved. Although at the time I was not able to understand the meaning of the dream beyond these few hints, new forces were released in me which helped me carry the experiment with the unconscious to a conclusion. As you probably know, Dr. Jung continued with his confrontation with the unconscious for another five years. And it took him another 10 years after that to record everything in the Red Book. This is why the Red Book is such a significant book for understanding Dr. Jung's work. I hope this broad discussion has been helpful in understanding what seems a very strange passage in the Red Book. So there you have it, the murder of the hero, and uh, it's a very complex um, area to talk about uh, and difficult to understand. I've been working on it for the best part of a week trying to put that video together, and uh, I think that some of you have already uh, pointed out that there's some interesting things here. Uh, Clark Nichols says, uh, you can reach your God only as an assassin. Now, um, one of the things that Dr. Jung is talking about here is uh, personality. And um, oh, let's see if I have this in a way that you can see. Okay, there we go. Uh, and so... He's often talking with us about um, the opposites in the psyche as the source of our psychic energy. And that's represented by the yin-yang symbol of Taoism. Interestingly, this week I saw on Facebook uh, an image almost exactly like the yin-yang, uh, which comes from Irish culture and was found at 5000 BC. Um, so, obviously, human beings have been thinking about these opposites for many thousands of years. And the issue is that uh, Dr. Jung, in this case, is talking about his intellect, but there has to be an opposite to his intellect that he was trying to address. Uh, he was trying to get to his soul uh, during the Red Book period. And... Um, in order to do that, he had to, he had to kill off his intellect. This is metaphorical. And so John and I were talking just now about um, the fact that many North Americans aren't able to even have a, an imagination such that um, they envision these things as real, which Dr. Young certainly believed that they were real. And so he was talking at the end of his life in Ion, but also in the Red Book at the beginning. Um, these are separated by 40 years, these two books. 
Um, but he was talking about the God in the depth of the psyche, the God image, so-called. In Jungian psychology, we call it the God image or the self, and that God is relates to our personality. And, um, and it's hard to change to the um, inferior side of the yin-yang in your own psyche. So Dr. Jung had this intellect, this beauty, beautiful being who metaphorically was Siegfried uh, for Germans. Um, and uh, he didn't think it was very important to him, but he realized in the dream that when he killed Siegfried, it caused uh, him tremendous anguish and he had to uh, struggle with that. But anyway, uh, do you want to say something more, uh, John, about that? Uh, no, I don't know a whole lot about the Siegfried myth. I just know how it influenced um, German culture in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so, any, in any case, what Dr. Jung is saying is, uh, in, in further comment on, on Clark's comment, um, it's, there's a pretty rigid line between the light and the dark in the yin-yang, and that line is the balance between order and chaos. We often hear uh, Jordan Peterson talking about order and chaos, and and we have to live our lives on that line and but in order to get across to the other side to understand the other part of ourselves which is part of individuation um, we have to trick it and so when dr jung is talking about assassination uh, or being a judas he means um, that he has to trick his superior function in order to get to his inferior function, which is his soul, which he's looking for uh, in the Red Book. And uh, I've already read uh, the early parts of the Red Book into the channel. You can find a playlist for that. And uh, you don't want to confuse it with the portions that refer to uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, um, that's this book, and it's a book written <clears throat> by Jungian analysts about the Red Book, a hundred years after the Red Book was written, uh, and I've put them both in the playlist just so you can have a juxtaposition between the two. Um, but I've already, um, I've already put part of the discussion about searching for soul and what Jung means by that is he's searching for his inferior function and when he started to do that his unconscious became active <clears throat> and the only way for him to do it was to metaphorically kill off the superior function which was Siegfried represented by Siegfried in his psyche. It might be represented by, you know, a general in the army in your psyche or whatever else you see as a hero in your community because each one of us have our dreams uh, based on images that have been taken in during our lifetime. Some images do go back much, much farther into antiquity, uh, but uh, many of the images that come to you in your dreams come from your actual life and it's just your psyche taking the images that it has to work with and trying to communicate with you through the images that it has to work with um, okay uh, i hope that helps clark uh, okay, Julie says, I think the importance of guilt is so underestimated, carry your own cross, perhaps so much of what we class as depression or neuroticism is in fact an unaccepted guilt. Um, 
certainly there's something to that. I think John may have some thoughts about guilt also. Um, I, go ahead. Well, the problem with guilt, I think, in, in my particular case, is that I don't really feel it as a conscious thing so much. So I think probably some of the danger of guilt is that it can be unconscious, where I think a lot of people feel it as a conscious force. Uh, so it's probably a little well, more insidious with those of us who feel it as, a, as an unconscious force. Well, and I think that organized religion has um, guilt-tripped us for a couple thousand years at least, maybe uh, if you go into some of the non-Christian religions <laughs> even longer than that. and they use it as a tool to keep you in the flock. It's kind of like a, a, a shepherd's crook or something like that. It definitely enforces the collective right. uh, consciousness. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, the neurosis it comes up when, uh, when you feel guilty because you haven't followed the collective. And so if you're a member of a church and you do something that isn't just right for the church, uh, naturally you're going to have some guilt. And um, uh, that would relate to the Arturian legend. And that, that's where the uh, Arturian knights entered the forest at the darkest place, right? And uh, I remember in my youth, we often talked about uh, girls who were Catholic who tended to be more promiscuous <laughs> because, because their dark side was uh, emerging because of being so good in church and, you know, being so perfect in church. And, and so they ended up being more promiscuous. And then... Uh, then they'd go into confessional and the, the priest would whip up on them probably and try to keep them in line that way, keep them in the collective. And obviously uh, that worked very effectively uh, for a couple thousand years in b bigger and bigger ways. Um, well, Neumann does talk also about the conflict you're speaking of between the collective and the instinct, the individual instinct. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he even talks about how it is sometimes necessary to sin. Uh, what he means, I think, by that is at least, at least not necessarily in act, but in in um, concept that one needs to recognize that the collective has a sort of dictatorial guilt guilt laden power. Yeah, because that's how they keep you in line. But I think it goes beyond church. I think it, oh, yeah, it goes I think way it's beyond def church. definitely a, a cultural milieu that sur has survived oh, yeah. the it, death it, of it, the it, churches. It, the churches it, are dying, and yet right. we still have It's actually even worse, it seems like. Right, but, <laughs> but uh, it, goes to, um, it goes to credit rating bureaus. You know, we now have three credit rating bureaus. Hardly seems enough, but they're, they whip you up and keep giving you a score to show you how good or bad you've been. And um, you're right. It's more of the general perfectionist masculine energy that uh, right. that Woodman talks about. Right. So it's it's forcing you into the collective, and um, you know maybe maybe that's not the ba best thing. Maybe we should just stop borrowing money, <laughs> and and uh, learn to pay as we go. If we if we did that, let's say uh, if we put off buying a house until we're 35, let's say, and we saved the amount we would put into a mortgage between 21 and 35, the banks would absolutely freak out, but then we'd have a house free and clear or with no debt. Um, so it's an interesting thought. Um, Clark says, this reminds me of people who get famous yet uh, they ha have all the attention but nothing to say. Uh, well, um, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, obviously, 
we've seen in the since the year 2000 we've seen a lot of instant millionaires in the uh, software industry and they all go out and buy a fancy car and a fancy house and so on and maybe maybe they just got lucky because they were in the right place at the right time and and maybe they're you know they don't keep their money same with professional football players or basketball players who very often you know make millions of dollars while they're playing and a lot of them spend it down very fast and then uh, they're 35 or 40 years old and they haven't learned how to live properly uh, because it just happened that they were blessed with some talent that uh, the, most of us don't have. Um, let's see, Julie says, uh, thanks for the It's just amazing. I'm totally hooked so much here. <laughs> some of dreams echo some that I've had. I've been collecting my dreams since very young. Well, not only should you collect your dreams, but also uh, meditate upon them because uh, your dreams and visions are actually communications from your unconscious and um, they're quite important and Dr. Young certainly felt that this dream that was in the video uh, was extremely important to him in his life and basically um, it uh, shaped the whole rest of his life um, partially because he was caught in the middle in the two world wars where he realized that he had these same instincts as other German men. He was a German speaking Swiss. And when he entered his uh, active imagination process happened to be before World War I, so he didn't really know what was happening to him. Um, but he certainly recognized it and he recognized even at that point in December of 1913 that this is what the Germans want to do. They want to use their willpower to uh, force their position on everybody else in the world and that's what they proceeded to try to do and of course they were defeated and then what Dr. Jung said is that by 1919 uh, he was already seeing in his consulting room that there was going to be another war because it hadn't been overcome yet. And that's, uh, that's this attitude that's represented by Siegfried um, that hadn't been yet overcome. And in the end, it had to, the only way to overcome it was by destroying the whole country and having to start over again. And that's basically what happened by 1945. Um, let's see, one dream several years ago, I could see myself standing between two dark figures. Blood was pouring from my forehead. I walked closer to myself and realized I had been shot in the head. Uh, wow, I... Um, one of the things that I don't do here is analyze dreams. Uh, I'm not a psychoanalyst and none of our current members are and uh, it would be wrong of me to suggest that I could interpret a dream like that. Um, what Dr. Jung's method said was that you should reflect on that dream and try to imagine what it is that your psyche is telling you about it. And this isn't as easy as a cookie cutter where you can go buy a symbol book. I mean, there are some books of symbols um, out there, but, uh, and there's a couple that are very good. Let's see if I can reach it. Uh, well, let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had my ankle replaced, so Jen's going to reach this book for me. Okay, so there's this book of symbols uh, by, published by Tashi, Reflections on Archetypal Images. Um, it's by um, a number of very prominent Jungian 
uh, analysts, I've never found it useful. And the reason is that whatever your psyche is presenting to you is unique to you. And yeah, I mean, if you have a dream about two dark figures, it may suggest something, uh, or being shot in the head may suggest something that might be in this book, but very unlikely, actually. Um, and so, while it's an interesting book, and it's an interesting book to uh, get access to certain archetypal images and so on, um, in terms of explaining your dream, I don't think uh, book you can get that from books because uh, you, your psyche is unique to you and it is in a specific situation at a specific moment and uh, so I don't think anybody can really give you a cookie cutter answer I think uh, a Jungian analyst might do it in analysis uh, but the for for the average person who doesn't have $150 an hour to pay to a union analyst for a few weeks to work out these things, I think that the answer is to simply, um, simply go back and reflect on these dreams and suddenly it will come to you. In, in Dr. Jung's case, as the story in the video related, um, you know, he woke up and his psyche was telling him, you have to understand this dream immediately. And so he said he had three sleepless nights over it and, and very tough days before he finally realized that this was the attitude, the standpoint of German men at that time, pre-World War I. And he realized that it was an attitude that need, needed to be overthrown, at least in himself. He didn't realize that there was a war coming per se. He was uh, about two months before this time uh, is when he started to have very disturbing visions about the commencement of World War I, and World War I wasn't there yet. And But he was having visions where blood was filling up Europe and he was seeing dead bodies in the rivers and so on uh, in these visions and dreams and he thought he might be having a psychotic incident and so when August 1st 1914 came around and World War I really got cooking uh, he was the happiest man in Europe because he realized he wasn't going psychotic and he also realized that he had discovered the collective unconscious, that you know, there, there were things going on that were collective and unconscious. And so that applies to us for our political situation today. You know, if we're intuitive, we, we can know how our political debate is going to come out over time. Um, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. I know it's uh, just skipping down, we can come back, but uh, Julie mentions that she paints her dreams in watercolors, and I paint my dreams as well, and it's a really productive thing to do. I can't quite explain why, but it allows you to connect with the, with the images a little bit more directly. I think, I think that's right, and, and Dr. Jung highly recommended that also. So I think that that's an excellent idea. Uh, let's see. Um, So, uh, Julie, I'm sorry I, I can't go more in detail on your specific dream. Um, Miles says, notice we are supposedly enlightened, but that means we are just confined to Cartesian thinking. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's fair enough. Uh, the workplace and the home for a lot of us is secular. Only those who go to a temple or synagogue or a church are being spiritual one day in a few hours only, typically soulless society. Um, well, I, I certainly think that that's right, and I think that there are a lot of people who have Siegfried-style attitudes in, um, in the powers that be who think that they can 
create an un uneducated population of people who will just, uh, you know, flip the burgers and deliver the milkshakes, <laughs> right? And, and that they don't have to educate people and, and so on. And um, that's certainly a soulless idea and a soulless society. And as a result, they've uh, written the arts right out of our curricula for, for most part. And that's extremely dangerous because it means that we're giving up our, our uh, intuitive ability to develop uh, new ideas. And that's always been a huge strength of the country, has been to uh, uh, be innovative. And if we're not willing to educate our population to have these, <laughs> these ideas, uh, you know, what's going to happen to us in 50 years? Go ahead. Yeah, one, one thing I wanted to say was last week I gave a talk about Woodman, Marion Woodman, and, she, and this is, it all seems to be related back to, at least in this country, to the idea that the masculine principle is dominant. And when mm. you're talking about flipping burgers and right. running assembly lines, you've got an, a rational process that is not appreciating the wholeness of humanity and the hu human life. Right. And therefore, the feminine principle needs to be brought back in, both for, for men and for women. It's right. not feminine as we think of it as feminine. It's more to do with the qualities that are not... Well, robust. we have an entertainment society. I mean, you know, what percentage of us on this uh, call uh, were watching the Oscars last night? I know I was, but, you know, that's not an authentic life for me. The only people that are having an authentic life at the Oscars are the actors themselves. And, you know, that's authentic for them. For the rest of us, we're just spectators. You know, the same is true of professional sports or sports of any kind. I mean, to a certain degree, you, you need them uh, because you need them to build up your body and so on and learn how to keep your health through exercise through your lifetime. But your point is they're vicarious thrills. And instead of we need to be doing our own art, we need to be doing our own dream, dream analysis, we need to be doing our own sports. And, Precisely. And, and I, concentrate more on the personal life that right. way. So, so if, you're, if you're just some guy who's sitting around the house watching the NFL all weekend or you know college football on Saturdays and the NFL on Sundays, um, that's not an authentic life. You know, that's, that's a cop-out. Um, the only people that are having an authentic life are the people that are down on the field. And, you know, you're just checking your brain out. And, um, you know, so to a certain extent, we need entertainment and we need ideation. I go to a lot of movies and have done for the last 60 years at least, maybe longer. <laughs> hate to admit it, but true. And... Um, uh, when when certain incidents happen in my life, I have movie scenes complete with dialogue that pops up in my mind. Okay, so my psyche is filled with a lot of these movie scenes, and so it's giving me um, my messages via these movie scenes that I've seen, and that's you know that's one way to do it. But I have to recognize that it's. My psyche is giving me messages about my life, not about that movie. <laughs> well, and I know some people who live their lives, uh, uh, you know, with uh, with acting out movies. Yeah, you know, well, that's, yeah. that's how they learn. Sure, but. sure. Um, so uh, let's see. Right. So, Julie, I, I don't want you to think that uh, either John or I is not religious, okay? I, um, I am officially a Christian. I have a wife who is uh, very officially a Buddhist uh, to the extent that she's uh, been to a three-year retreat. Um, and so... It, in effect has a completed divinity school for Buddhists um, and um, so but we don't go to services regularly 
And uh, I am with Dr. Jung. I think a lot of his uh, way of thinking about the God image because uh, I've had enough incidents occur in my life so that I have no need to believe, I know. And, and I also don't need a creed. Uh, and you can find references on the YouTube channel to um, an article by Edward Edinger, um, a lecture about um, once you've had a religious experience, which he describes, um, you don't need a creed, You're, you just know. And so that's, I guess Dr. Jung would call it the religion-making function. He's not saying it's the same as the theological, metaphysical God. Uh, he's saying he doesn't know anything about that, but what he does know is what's in the psyche of humanity, and we're all... Um, we all have this in us, regardless of our nationality or where we live. And his point was that human beings can't tell the difference between the God image, which is the self, which is the deepest archetype empirically proven in his lifetime in the psyche. We can't tell the difference between that and the metaphysical God. So. Uh, theologians know a lot about the metaphysical God. Dr. Jung knew about the God image, and, um, you know, that's good enough for me. That's equal to God to me. Um, and, um, and I follow Buddhism to a certain extent because it's about duality, and Dr. Jung is uh, about the opposites, which is the same thing, and so... I'm interested in that. It comes up in Taoism also, and also in Hinduism. Um, and But I don't think any one has the end-all, be-all answer on these things. I have a point to make. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I think revisiting a church, if it's a Christian church or a Buddhist church or whatever, temple, whatever you call it, if you if you had a parting of the ways in the in the past, if you understand Jung, you start reading Jung, and then you go back into the church, it becomes and you meaningful. look at the symbols, yeah. you realize the importance of the symbols and how the symbols elevate the human being to where he belong where he belongs. Absolutely, with, and so that sort of brings. A religious attitude back into that old structure and absolutely. it transforms it absolutely and I you know when my wife and I started to uh, uh, get involved with Buddhism about 25 years ago I was noticing that uh, being involved with Buddhism was making me a better Christian <laughs> so, <laughs> and now being involved with Dr. Jung has made me a better Buddhist and a better Christian so um, Miles asks, are we more easily duped as long as we are living in a collective that is secular? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of Dr. Jung's fu good point. fundamental ideas. Very that, good point. That this is what individuation is about. That as long as you go along with the flow and don't make any waves, um, yeah, you can get on getting along, but... Um, that doesn't improve society because then you're going by somebody else's rules and uh, it doesn't give you wholeness because you're just following the rules. Um, Miles says, well, we, f oh, we will follow the orders of the secular authority because God is dead apparently. This is in spite of what we are, we're, are told in religion that has started so many wars, really, then communism and fascism killed many. Um, Those are just secular religions. Yeah, uh, there's, oh. they're secular religions. Dr. Jung talked about all isms as being those wretched isms because uh, they all filled this 
um, God image um, idea and then people got stuck in them. I mean, when, when Nazi Germany got strong or when the USSR got strong, who was going to fight them? Um, you know, they had the secret police everywhere and they had all the neighbors thinking on them on another and all kinds of stuff was going on. Yeah, so there was a point where Stalin had issued uh, orders to send lists of, uh, of people who were rebelling against authority within the domain and uh, the operatives in the districts didn't have enough names so they simply went to the phone book and pulled names at random out of the uh, out of the telephone book. Mm -hmm. So it is quite frightening. And took them out and shot them. Well, they put them in gulags or whatever they did with them, or yeah. shot them or whatever. Well, 20 million of them they shot, besides the ones they put in gulags. Um, so Clark says, I've been feeling like, like that for uh, the last few years, that the overculture didn't understand the effect of the internet and it would lead to something bad. Now we have tariffs again. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the jury is still out on the internet because in one sense, um, the kids are educating themselves. They're learning a lot faster than we learned when we were young. And, um, you know, I... I went to a country school for two years, which was a, a house with two floors. And on the bottom floor was kindergarten through third grade, and on the first floor was fourth grade through sixth grade. <laughs> and that was my school for two years. And, uh, you know, you can imagine how limited that was, but, um, but uh, today, uh, kids can go out and learn anything they want, and um, and the stories about that are pretty awesome. But the the downside of it is that people are also learning that other people live differently and live better than they do, and so they recognize that their cultures often are holding them back, and so there's a lot of rebelliousness that's being fo foisted on the world through the internet because um, things that weren't acceptable in cultures um, 50 years ago uh, are now acceptable and uh, the powers that be don't like that <laughs> very definitely um, let's see um, Julie says, I was amazed when I discovered you and still don't really understand him, though. Uh, just feel some solace that he existed. Um, Julie, we all feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree uh, to that. <laughs> there, there, there are 20 volumes of his collected works, plus two volumes of collected letters, plus other volumes of collected letters. And they're saying that they're going to reissue the collected works in about 30 volumes. Um, the book, um, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is this book, uh, which passes as his memoir, uh, is an, an editing down of something called The Protocols, which Dr. Jung developed with the Aniela Yaffe, uh, near the time of his death, and apparently the protocols are 800 pages long, and they're finally going to publish those um, later this year. <laughs> and uh, I was told last August by James Hollis that there are about 90,000 letters of Dr. Jung's that have never been published, and you know, they're trying to work out ways to do it. Uh, so what I found is that whenever I am troubled uh, for whatever reason, and it happens to all of us for one reason or another, uh, things happen in our lives, our parents die or whatever it is, if I pick up 
one of Dr. Young's works and start to read it, somehow I feel better. <laughs> and it's, it's something like having your own analyst at your fingertips. And uh, I can do it entirely randomly. And I've been doing this now for 30 years and to the point where I'm now sort of overcome by it. I'm obsessed by it. And that's why I'm doing this YouTube channel and have been doing this YouTube channel uh, because I think that it's something that can help a lot of us. And it certainly helped me. And that's why I started our meetup group so that uh, I could help others find Dr. Young and interpret his ideas. So um, let's see. Miles says, everyone needs to read the 1975 report of the Trilateral Commission that said enlightened and informed people in a democracy are the problem. Uh, <laughs> or the Powell Memorandum uh, f for more Siegfrieds. Well, the Powell Memorandum, I know, certainly know the Powell Memorandum. And basically, um, Justice Powell was... Uh, on our Supreme Court, and he wrote a memorandum to conservatives about the time he was elevated to the Supreme Court, in which he talked about how um, the powers that be could dominate the American population. And basically, we've seen that play out uh, in uh, our politics. And so we all need to be conscious of that memorandum. And um, I'm sh the, I think, Miles, you're talking about the, the 1975 report of the Trilateral Commission. I think that's a Canadian report, if I'm not mistaken. I know you live in Canada. Uh, so um, it's probably something that we all need to be conscious of because we're all being dominated. Um, Miles says the Powell memo said that free enterprise and banks are threatened by too much government regulation. Um, well, certainly they feel so. Uh, but the, the opposite problem is that, for example, uh, and it's going to become a much bigger problem for us in the next few years unless it's stopped, is that um, uh, banks, when they have no reg regulation, will do whatever, whatever they want. And what they do is they inflate uh, the economy and then cause a crash. And they always make money, but it's the rest of us in the middle who get crushed. And, um, uh, you know, I'm an example. And, but what they did was, instead of operating on the financial measures used by the Federal Reserve, they basically created an alternate currency uh, off the books by putting them into mortgage-backed securities. And many of those mortgage-backed securities were fraudulent. Um, they simply, all they did was copy the file and <laughs> change a few names and uh, some little uh, village in Norway would buy bonds from this security, not knowing that there weren't actually any uh, mortgages behind it. And so what they did was they created a huge inflation uh, that was off the books that the Federal Reserve looked at that controlled our money supply. And so this is why when the crash occurred in 2008, the Fed took the, the interbank interest rate down to zero and it still didn't get the economy really going again. I mean, they pretend the economy is going, but there are plenty of uh, men my age who lost uh, their jobs and have never been employed again and are uh, very troubled. And so the economy hasn't really gotten going again, and it's only after a decade that they're talking about raising the interest rate rate where the Federal Reserve can control something again. But what happened was there was a huge deflation as there was um, 
in the 60s and seven early 70s um, but um, nobody recognized it as a deflation because it was happening in this false currency that was not on the books of the Federal Reserve so nobody reported it um, and so they need to be watched and they need to have regulation everyone okay so the personal uh, let's see Holy Grail question. Where, where is it here? Right here. Oh. Can we speak okay. a little? Yeah, let's talk about the Holy Grail. So, um, the Holy Grail fundamentally is um, Dr. Jung's interpretation of individuation. So, the Holy Grail would be um, recognizing. Um, recognizing uh, all the functions within yourself. So if you happen to be a sensing person and you get all the detail, um, but you're not very intuitive, it would be uh, being able to develop your intuition. And if you're a thinking person, it would be developing your feeling side. And so in this story that Dr. Jung, that we began this with, um, the only way Dr. Jung could get across that boundary of his yin-yang from his intellect uh, was that in his dream, metaphorically, um, he had to, to kill his intellect so that his soul would have a chance uh, to come forth and uh, to give him a sense of the other side of his personality, the so-called inferior function of his personality. Yeah. And um, so um, John needs to go this evening and, and our other members for various reasons uh, haven't made it tonight because uh, we're meeting at my home for a few weeks uh, due to my ankle surgery. Um, but I will certainly continue on and chat with you. John, thanks. Let's be in touch. Okay, Skip. Yep, take care. Um, let's see. So, in, in any case, the, the Holy Grail um, is um, being able to do that individuation. And what Dr. Jung, and especially Dr. Edinger, was talking about in this book, uh, which was part of that video, and I'll just uh, go back to it for a moment uh, because it's an important point. Um, the attitude of the heroic ego is only relevant for the first half of life. When one comes to the second half of life, where conscious individuation is required, then the heroic attitude has to die, as the myth makes clear. And so the point is, okay, our movies uh, beginning, let's say, with Star Wars in 1976 have always gone through this hero's journey and, and the hero myth, and we see it time and again. I mean, if you um, apply the basic principles of the hero myth, um, then, then you can see what's going on in the first half of life. But unfortunately, we're not well educated for how to deal with the second half of life. And nowadays, we're living 55, 60 years after the period of the hero's journey, and uh, which is where the midlife crisis comes in. And... So then one has to find meaning to their lives. That's, that's the gist of it. And so the Holy Grail is that. Now, let me just, I think I have in, within reach here. Uh, where is it? Oh, yes. One of my uh, big criticisms of Jungian analysts is they've hidden... Uh, some of the important things that Dr. Jung said uh, about religion um, 
and in the Union Institutes have done that too. So Dr. Ed Edward Edinger wrote this book, The New God Image, which basically refers to um, refers to um, 14 letters that Dr. Jung wrote uh, and seven of these le letters never appeared in the published letters but they're extremely important for understanding um, religion and um, let me see if I can give you an example um, okay so Dr. Jung was writing uh, to a pastor named David Cox, and he wrote this letter on the 25th of September, 1957, and um, he says the following. Um, it's a very long letter. It's about 10 pages long, but there's a very important paragraph here that I want to read to you. Although all this sounds as if it were sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific, psychological language. For instance, instead of using the term God, say unconscious, instead of Christ, self, instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious, instead of salvation or redemption, individuation, instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions or of wholeness. And this is individuation and this is the, the objective of the uh, Holy Grail. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it can co coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid to understanding religious traditions. And um, so the first thing we have to understand is what these myths mean to us as intelligent, educated uh, modern men, uh, obviously 500 years ago and before, um, the priests were speaking metaphorically because nobody knew any better and so they could get away with it. But after the year 1500, after Galileo looked through his telescope and said, hey, <laughs> the earth isn't the center of the universe, uh, after that, the scientific method just started to punch holes in Christianity and uh, continued to do so right up to the present. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, Nietzsche said, God is dead. Uh, but what he meant by that is that um, the fairy tale that you're told in Bible school uh, isn't true. Well, it's not true in a physical sense, but as Dr. Jung said in answer to Job, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. And so every religious statement is a psychic fact. And this was one of the overarching ideas of his psychology over many years. Um, let's see. Julie says, uh, well, Julie says, I think the internet is amazing. It's up to the individual how they use it. Absolutely. And I think that, um, uh, it is going to aid individuation because people get to decide for themselves what is important, no doubt about that. Um, and uh, then I had a dream about Jung a few days ago. He was a detective in a TV series. I asked him if he solved mysteries. 
He said, yes. <laughs> Boy, that's for sure. Uh, Clark says, Jung's big idea might be broken down as we're all on this journey to find ourselves something deeply personal and yet communal. Um, certainly, uh, Clark, that's uh, correct. I, I've joked about it lately that, you know, when we're all running around the place staring at our iPhones, um, including all our kids, what's everybody looking for? Well, everybody's looking for their self, okay, in the capital S and Dr. Jung's sense of the term self. And so if you want to understand the structure of the psyche, please um, look at the first four chapters of Ion. And I have read those first four chapters onto this uh, YouTube channel. And I've also read Dr. Edward Edinger's commentary on it. Uh, Dr. Ed, Edward Edinger um, made a big part of his career helping people understand what Dr. Jung was saying. And so uh, I started the process of reading both Ion and Edinger's commentary side by side. And you can find that Ion playlist uh, on this YouTube channel. And uh, so you don't even have to get the book. You don't have to read it. You can just listen to it. And what he is discussing there is the fundamental ideas that are, that are the structure of the psyche. And it starts with uh, chapter one is the ego. Chapter two is the shadow. Chapter three is the syzygy which is the yoking together in the yin-yang sense of the masculine and feminine, uh, which is a major part of human psychology, obviously. And then chapter four is the self, which is uh, the deepest archetype uh, in human psychology. It's an archetype that Dr. Jung proved empirically uh, through his research, scientific research, and um, it's also called the God image, and it's uh, also discussed in, uh, in two of Dr. Edward Edinger's lectures. Um, one is um, uh, Jung's Myth for Modern Time, Individuation, and the other is Encounters with the Greater Personality, and the Greater Personality is the self. And once you've had that experience, um, there's, you don't need any belief anymore um, because um, you simply know. And um, probably those that are listening to this broadcast already have had such an experience. Uh, but anyway, the, the uh, Dr. Edinger's uh, lectures can be found on YouTube and also uh, I was so taken with them that I created transcripts of them. I can't write this instant. Well, maybe I can uh, give you links. Uh, if you go to archetypeatraction.com uh, and then click on any uh, article, it'll take you to a second page where Dr. Edinger's things are. Let me see if I can get that quickly. Um, just uh, give you the link to it. Um, okay, so here is um, Dr. Edinger's um, individuation lecture. And in this uh, link is also the actual audio. Uh, it wasn't a video. And uh, get the other one. And this is a website that I've managed uh, for a long time. 
and uh, so everything that is there was put there by me since 2010 and so here's uh, encounters with uh, greater personality let's see what those problem was that they're too long. Okay, the second one is uh, encounters with a greater personality. Do those links go through? Okay, so the first one is individuation. The second one is myth, and uh, the myth for individuation. And uh, I was so taken with them, I, I actually listened to it about 10 times each. And finally, I said, I, I just have to look at the words. I can't just get it all through my ears. And so I sat down and I spent about a week and a half on each one of these lectures and created these transcripts. And so I think they're very valuable and you should read them. Um, let's see. Let's see. Clark says, I'm writing a story and I'm trying to escape the hero's journey by making a story that speaks to the Job story. Uh, so, um, one, uh, Clark, one thing that might help you is that I also read Answer to Job in its entirety uh, into the website and you can find a, a um, playlist of the entire book, Answer to Job. Um, and uh, let me just mention that the Job archetype is uh, one of the most important uh, things to be conscious of in Jungian psychology because it's about having an authentic life. And basically the Job archetype says that you need to have a contest, a defeat, a lamentation about the defeat, and a rebirth. And you need to go through that cycle many times during your lifetime. And if you do, each time you go through that cycle, your ego will be uh, strengthened. And so my example of that is the uh, reality program, The Voice, which gives everybody a chance to become a, a star. Um, but very soon most people can't be a star and don't play the guitar well enough or sing well enough and so they suffer a defeat and uh, then uh, i'm sure that they lament about the fact that they aren't in the top 10 of that program or whatever it is and uh, then they get reborn into the next thing that they should try to be in their lifetime and but as a result of that, their ego is strengthened because they know how to deal with that disappointment. And I, I heard James Hillman giving a lecture one time and he said, can't we find a defeat in here somewhere? And, uh, you know, really that's what Jungian analysts are looking for is defeats. That's who comes to see them actually as people who've uh, are depressed or down about their lives for some reason, very often, I suppose. And the point is that if you know that cycle of um, contest, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth, um, then you can, you can be seaworthy. You can be very, very strong. And this is what happened with Job. He was defeated time and again by Yahweh. Um, in more and more hideous ways, thanks to the work of Satan. Uh, but he never gave up on God, and because he never gave up a God, on God, eventually um, he got everything back and more. And so um, that's a lesson that we all need, uh, and that's the fundamental thing to get out of the Job story, definitely. Uh, 
And let's see. Then Miles says, yes, Jesus is us. If we go to the spirit of the depths, never leaves us, loves us un unconditionally. Um, well, absolutely. And I think that um, we're not little children anymore. And there's no question in my mind that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Um, but did he rise from the dead in the physical world? No, he didn't. Um, and, you know, even if you believe any of the stories that say he escaped the cross and went on living for another 70 or 80 years or whatever it was, uh, and there are plenty of those stories as well, anyway, he was a man, a physical man, and he died. Uh, but that's the point, and the point that Dr. Young made was that we have to live this life. And if your spirit is going to live on, it's going to live on in the works of this life. Uh, and it may live on through your children and your grandchildren and your progeny. And you are the result of probably millions of rebirths, uh, physical rebirths, since the first living creature on the planet uh, and so we are all part of a chain that goes back all the way to the Big Bang uh, and if your life is going to have meaning going forward it's going to be because you leave it and you leave that meaning behind you in one way or another it could be as simple as uh, leaving your children behind which is the way most People do it but you know Dr. Edinger talked about um, let me just make sure I'm on camera here uh, talked about leaving an escrow of his lectures where he was uh, explaining Dr. Young and uh, he made it his life's work he um, Dr. Edinger and Esther Harding founded the C.G. Young Institute in New York and later on, he moved to L.A. and became a uh, Jungian analyst in L.A. He was also a psychiatrist like Dr. Jung. Uh, but he spent all his spare time writing lectures, which he gave at the C.G. Jung uh, Institute in L.A. For the most part, sometimes he gave it in San Diego. And those lectures we have in the form of 17 books in which he explained Dr. Jung's uh, oeuvre. So I urge you, if you are having difficulty with Dr. Jung's work, that you uh, go and find some of uh, Dr. Edinger's uh, books. And by the way, uh, on Answer to Job, uh, there is an Edinger book called Transformation of the God Image, uh, which is an excellent book, and it basically is 10 lectures on Answer to Job. And so that might also help you, Clark. Um, let's see. I am just happened to be the first work of Jung I got into. I am can be just staggering if you read it at the right time in your life. Uh, I agree entirely. <laughs> I, I think Ion is probably a little much for most people. Um, I think, um, uh, well, let, let's say this. I got into Dr. Young's work th in stages. Um, at first, it was because I learned about the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and I studied that heavily for about three years. And then I happened upon... Um, uh, I happened upon Man and His Symbols, which was a book that Dr. Jung wanted written for laymen at the end of his life. And it just happened to be about the same time that I broke my ankle in the first place. I managed to break my ankle as the last thing I did in uniform. <laughs> and uh, so uh, after 28 years, they finally had to replace the replacement or the repair. And, um, but um, any, anyway, uh, at that time I read Man and His Symbols and then um, my mother gave my wife um, 
Women Who Run With the Wolves. Uh, and I also read uh, Jean Shinoda Boland's books, uh, Gods in Every Man and Goddesses in Every Woman. And those got me interested generally in um, the idea of archetypes and, and story and so on. And, but finally, I, and for many years, until probably until 2005 or so, I thought Dr. Jung's collected works were really about clinical psychology. And because I didn't want to become a clinical psychologist, I never looked at them. But then when I started to read them uh, directly for the first time, I said, wow, oh my God, this is great stuff. And um, I started to be guided by a man named Louis LaFontaine, who runs a a wonderful page on Facebook called Carl Jung Depth Psychology. I urge you to take a look at it. He now has about 62,000 followers on his Facebook page um, called Carl Jung Depth Psychology. And he produces a prodigious amount of uh, quotes on of Dr. Jung's work. Uh, but you, you really need to get, eventually you need to get some structure into it. And I became very interested in the societal aspects of Jungian psychology and how psychic epidemics uh, have caused horrible results in the world. Um, and we are seeing a huge... Uh, psychic neurosis in the United States right now and it's uh, kind of spreading around the world but this neurosis between uh, the right and the left and uh, obviously what we need is some healing. Now Dr. Jung's answer to neurosis was that you never cure neurosis, you simply grow out of it and uh, I've been working for many years to try to give people hooks on how we can grow out of these uh, national neuroses. Uh, let's see. Failures of your life are kind of more important than the wins because they signal the next chapter is more, that's more effective, authentic. Uh, yeah, it's definitely true. I mean, if you keep winning all the time, uh, then you don't learn anything. I mean, we have a president that's like that now, and he uh, was able to behave like a bully uh, through his lifetime, and that served him well, but then all of a sudden he gets into a complex organization like the U.S. government, and he finds out that he can't just have it his way all the time. And that didn't protect that didn't prepare him well for the presidency, it seems to me. And so we, we see someone who has an undeveloped um, ego. Um, you know, I asked one of it happens that I go to a Buddhist meditation group with five women psychologists. They're not Jungians, but they're psychologists. One of them, and uh, I asked one of them, uh, you know, what about you know, uh, the president's ego? And she said, oh, he has a teeny weeny little ego because that's what bullies do. They have to protect that teeny weeny little ego that they have. And I remember when I was in the fourth grade and going to that country school, I was being bullied by uh, a farm kid that was a bit bigger than me at the time, he was probably in the fifth grade and I was in the fourth. And uh, my father said, well, um, a hard boiled egg is always yellow inside. And so the next day um, we were in line for the water fountain. I mean, we had 30 kids in the class and we had one water fountain. So we would have these breaks when we could line up and uh, get a drink. And so I was in line with for the water fountain with this kid and he was pushing me or something and I just turned around to him and I said that I just said a hard-boiled egg is always yellow inside 
And boy, something just shifted at that moment because after that, he never gave me any trouble and we became friends. So, um, you know, it's something to think about if you have kids that are being bullied. Um, seems to me tr Young truly makes Jesus Christ Catholic. Uh, in, uh, in other words, universal. Um, certainly he does, but he also makes Buddha Catholic. <laughs> and and uh, he also, um, uh, you know, he also legitimizes all religions, really. Uh, as a young person, you really fear the failure. You fear your death, but it, if you learn to love the failure process, I think that's the essence of it, Clark, that if we learn to uh, embrace our failures and let that inform us about uh, the fact that we need to take another step, it really doesn't matter what the next step is. You just keep taking steps. And as uh, poet David White once said, I know how he learns. He gets um, beaten by bigger and bigger, I won't say what he said, the type of people he talked about, but uh, anyway, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very nice. Um, but the point, point is that we learn by being defeated and then we move on and if we're wise, we um, lament for briefer and briefer times. Um, okay, so, um, okay. All right, uh, so we've uh, been here for ne nearly two hours, notwithstanding the um, uh, difficulties with the technology. Uh, I think I'll call it quits for now because uh, it's uh, my wife's bedtime at 10 o'clock. Uh, we both get up at 6 in the morning to work. And uh, I'm often working on videos at 6 in the morning, believe it or not. Um, I will be co uh, conducting another Q&A uh, this Thursday at 1.30. Uh, and we will be continuing on with Answer to Job. And so I've committed to uh, go through Answer to Job with the online community. And I'm going to be doing that at 1.30 on Thursday afternoons, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And so I hope you'll join us. And otherwise, uh, we will do our best to continue on offering our group meetings uh, online, at least during my recovery from my surgery. After that, we're going to have to decide um, how to do our group meetings um, because uh, since uh, last summer when I had my knee replaced we actually took three months off and I missed the group meetings more than ever anybody and so this time around I didn't want to take so much time off and so people agreed to come here but so far it's only John that's come on Monday night so um, we're hoping that others will uh, start coming again. We may have to go back to the restaurant in order to make it appealing to some of the women, I suppose. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie, thanks for your comment about my ion reading. Um, it's uh, all of this has been a challenge. I actually didn't want to start reading the, the Red Book because I think that that's even a bigger challenge. And somehow I started to read it and it started to get even more hits and more minutes watched on the YouTube channel than anything else, which is why I kept going with it to a certain extent. But I have been thinking about getting back to I am because as it stands now, I think I'm only up to paragraph 80, and uh, it's a 460 paragraph long book, so uh, there's a lot more to read, and uh, it's obviously tough going, uh, and 
you know, what I would say is we shouldn't try to memorize these things. Um, but if, um, if we get familiar with some of these ideas and get facile with them, then it's easier to understand them as we look at them over and over and to actually start to understand the depth of what Dr. Jung was talking about. When you see that depth and understand that it not only applies to you and your family and your, so and your social friends, but also to our whole society and to the whole of humanity, then it becomes quite gargantuan. And so my purpose here has been to uh, make it more and more accessible to people. And I don't know if I'm always right in what I say about Dr. Young. I, what I'm trying to do, I'm not saying that he's always right. I'm saying that um, this is what I think he was saying. And I think a lot of people who pay attention to it um, think so too, that it's important. And uh, so as long as I can, I'm going to keep working with this and see what we, what we can accomplish overall. So I'll probably go back to Ayat. I'm glad that you mentioned it though. Um, and uh, Julie says, uh, you think you need to by the hard bound. I agree with that. You definitely need to buy the hard bound. <laughs> uh, you know, my reading is only a, a way to whet your interest in it. Uh, let's see, I think I could give you, uh, I have done a few times uh, before I've given um, an image that Dr. Edinger put into um, his commentary on ion, which is the structure of the psyche. And if I can get it up here quickly, which I think I can do, um, then I will share it with you so that you can see the, see the structure, which is, uh, is a very important thing for those that are not familiar with it. Uh, let's see. This is it. Okay. Okay. So this is um, this is Dr. Edinger's um, structure of the psyche um, for. Let's see if I lean this way. There, I'm more in the picture now. Um, this is his structure of the psyche vis-a-vis -vis the first four chapters of Ion. And so in this image, at the top, we have a male ego, a, um, a female ego, and a, let's see, it's a, I think it's a combined ego, something like that. And then coming down from it, the darkened area is the shadow. So the first chapter is the ego, then the shadow pointing down toward the self. And the shadow goes through the anima and animus, which is chapter three, the syzygy, so-called, uh, which syzygy means a yoked pair, like the, like the uh, yin-yang symbol. And then... Uh, down into the self, which it relates to the personal self, the uh, local community self, the world self, and then the universe self. Um, and um, it's quite a profound picture, I think, because it really gives you a sense of your psyche at depth. Uh, and then chapter five goes on with talking about uh, Jesus as a metaphor for the self. Um, so to the extent that that's useful, um, let's see. 
and uh, Clark says, just remember Jung wants us to make our own connections. I agree with that entirely. Um, I'm only giving you my cut on it, and it's based on my experience, which is quite broad compared to a lot of people, but it's still not your experience, and so you need to connect to it and understand what he's saying to you. Um, okay. So anyway, so thank you all for participating this week. We will uh, do our best to start again next week at 8 p.m. And I'll have to uh, consult with my local colleagues about what our topic will be next week. Uh, I do have at least one other member that I expect will be here next week, along with John, John and Bill. Bill's our PhD, uh, although he's not a Jungian PhD, but nonetheless PhD he is. And um, uh, we'll continue on discussing and trying to answer your questions. And so thank you again for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. I am always available. You can write to skip.conover at gmail.com. If you're not a member of our Dropbox, uh, which contains electronic copies of all the collected works, plus the collected letters, etc., um, you can send me your regular email address, not a Facebook address, but a regular email address to skip.conover at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to add you to the Dropbox if you're not already a member. Thank you for joining me tonight. I'm going to shut off the stream at this point. <laughs>